We're going to sing another song before our speaker uh, comes up to the platform. I want you to know who she is. Mary Poplin has uh, been at the university, or Claremont Graduate University, for many years. She's taught there. She's been an administrator. She has worked with Mother Teresa, which is why I asked her to come here this morning. But uh, there's so many other things Mary could be doing with us. She, uh, she has begun to work on the application of, the, of intellectual, social, and psychological principles of the Judeo-Christian worldview as they apply to higher education. Now, that's a mouthful, but it's the very thing that needs to be done. She's written two good books. Uh, I couldn't decide which one to ask her to speak on. Uh, when, one is called simply uh, Finding Calcutta, which is what she will speak on, what Mother Teresa taught me about meaningful work and service. But she's written another really wonderful book called Is Reality Secular? Testing the Assumptions of Four Global Worldviews. Now, she's uh, every bit the intellectual she sounds like, but she's every bit the sister in Christ and the warm and loving human being that uh, anyone who spends any time with her uh, gets to enjoy. So, Mary, we welcome you here, and uh, we'll be ready to hear you. But let's stand and sing one more time. Wow. You get to hear this many times a week or... At least once a week, huh? That's amazing. Hallelujah. It is finished. And you know what? Um, I don't know about you, but when I went to church, I didn't understand that that had a lot to do with everything else that I was going to do in my life, and that it had a lot to do with even my intellectual thoughts in every class I took. But I didn't know that in biology and psychology classes and history classes and everything. So I want to tell you a little bit about how I got that way. So maybe it'll, um, maybe it'll help some of you. Uh, when I went to college, uh, like you, I would have uh, said to anybody who walked up to me and asked that I was a Christian. Um, I'd gone to church. Uh, my father read the Bible every night. Um, not to us, but to himself. I went to Sunday school, and I think I passed confirmation class. My parents said they were Christian, and so I figured I was a Christian. In college, though, no one talked about God. So I didn't go to a Christian college where, you know, the biology professor could talk about God. I went to a secular college. And um, no one talked about God. No one talked about how you related to the life of the mind. So soon, God and Jesus just became a sort of distant memory for me, something that I only did on holidays when I went back to visit my parents. This happened pretty quickly, actually. By the time I got to graduate school, I was a full-fledged disco runner. <laughs> okay, don't laugh. You guys are still listening to the same music. I hear it all the time in your restaurants. <laughs> okay, so after that, there began to be a kind of moral slide. Now, none of this was really a conscious decision. I was just kind of going along with my crowd and uh, pretty soon that moral slide, which looked a little bit innocent at first, became increasingly dangerous. From where I stand now, I think this is what happens. Or this is what happened to me. Um, I had never really said to Jesus I was going to follow him. I mean, maybe I sang it in some songs and things like that. But Jesus says a very odd thing. He says you have to be born again. And, you know, people laugh at that phrase, but the reality is Jesus has no grandchildren. <laughs> it's like your par my parents were Christian. That didn't mean I was born a Christian. There's absolutely no principle in the Bible that suggests that because my parents are Christian, I will be a Christian. I actually have to make that decision. That's why Jesus said you have to be born again. This means we have to decide for ourselves. And it's some, in some ways, at your age and even at my age, we have to decide that over and over. We have to sort of reconfirm it. Well, I was too busy. I, uh, I loved college, and then I loved graduate school, as you might imagine, since I became a professor. And finally, my just not being a Christian turned into something called spiritual and not religious. That was my way of saying, I'm really, I really am a good person but I don't need a religion, and I certainly don't need a God, and I certainly don't need Jesus to be good. And then later I became even more hostile. 
I'm actually perfectly described in Romans 1. In Romans 1, Paul tells us that we all know from the evidence, and I'm talking about astrological evidence, biological evidence, psychological evidence, we all know God. But some turn away, and he says their foolish minds become darkened. And though they think themselves wise, they're actually fools. Now that was me. And at 41, I was already a full, fully tenured professor at the Claremont Colleges, and I had a dream. And in this dream, I'm in a long line of people who are dressed in gray robes. And we're just walking, not really on a floor, but we are on some kind of level, level thing. But we're in like we're suspended in a night sky. And we're walking very slowly, and we're not looking at each other. We're not talking to each other. And we, um, we're just going somewhere. And we're all in black and white like most dreams are, right? And then all of a sudden I realize we're going to pass by something on the right that's not, that's actually in color, because there's like a yellow light coming out. And when I get there, thank goodness I had gone to Sunday school and seen all the pictures, I see that it's actually the Last Supper. And the disciples are there, and they're talking to each other. They're kind of moving around. They're eating. And then suddenly I realize that actually Jesus is not at the table with them. And I look up ahead, and there, also in color, is Jesus. And we're a line that looks infinite, beginning of the line looks infinite, the end of the line looks infinite, we're all having to pass by Jesus. And when I get to him in this dream, I know who he is, and I look at him and I have two revelations. I have a first revelation is that I, my body is made of millions, I understand it's really billions, of cells. And so I have this awareness of these individual cells, and the second thing that I understand about myself is that every single cell in my body is filled with filth, just filth. And at that, I can't look at Jesus anymore. And so I start to cry, and I fall down at his feet. And in the dream, Jesus places his hands on my shoulders like this. And when he touched me, I felt what Paul calls the, the peace that's beyond understanding. I was so peaceful that it was almost like I didn't exist, but I did exist. And then I woke up and I found out I was crying. Well, actually, a person who had been a graduate student of mine, who was Native American, who I thought, oh, a dream, a spiritual dream. I thought it was a spiritual dream. You see, when you're that far out, you can't even understand that it's Christ that's calling you. But this person helped me know who it was and to begin to read the Bible. My own actual um, passion in research is to understand and promote teachers, highly effective teachers, in the worst schools in Los Angeles. I'm talking about schools that are in the bottom 10% of the state, okay? And so it's really like the education of the poor is really a strong driving force in my life. But now I'm sort of tiptoeing around Christianity, tiptoeing because I was at a secular university. I knew this was going to plummet my status. And uh, so I, I decided that maybe on this next sabbatical I should go and work with Mother Teresa. Who would know more about how Jesus and the poor went together? What did it look like to serve Jesus from Christ's perspective? So the first day I walk in, first of all, I've been in Calcutta now a day and a half. Calcutta is the most chaotic city in the world. It has the highest water pollution, the highest air pollution, and the highest sound pollution, mostly because taxis sit in traffic that's not moving and honk the entire time. So I walked into this building, and when I walked in, it was like I had entered another country. There was so much peace, and everything was quiet. I later learned that they didn't believe their first work was to, work with, was to actually work with the poor, that their first work was to pray, and pray unceasingly and stay close to Jesus, who they believed was the only reason they could do the work they did. 
And if you saw the work they did day in and day out, you would probably agree. I also learned that one of the reasons it was quiet is they had a rule at the Missionaries of Charity that they were not allowed to speak during the, day, during the work day unless what they were going to say was necessary for the work to be done. That's a pretty interesting rule. <laughs> you should be an introvert if you join the Missionaries of Charity, I should say. But the thing she taught me the most was about forgiveness. When I got there, Christopher Hitchens' book against Mother Teresa, the radical atheist who wrote all those books and, um, against God and against Mother Teresa and did a film against Mother Teresa, hit, that book had just come out, and the sisters knew about it. Somebody had given them a copy. So I went and bought it, and I read it. And then I began to watch the sisters and talk to them. One of the sisters told me that Mother Teresa said, it matters not. Every time you're humiliated, use it to build humility. Wow. There's an idea. <laughs> they had actually decided as a group of permanent sisters, the ones that have the blue stripes across their band, uh, bands across their head, um, they had decided to fast for one week together and then to come together after they had read the book. They were going to pass it around, all of them read it, fast a week, then come together and ask themselves, what's God's message for us here. And they did, and I said, what was your message? And they said, oh, it's a call for us to become more holy. Well, I never really found Christopher Hitchens doing that for me, but, <laughs> but for them, they understood. They understood the basic principles of Christianity. Christianity is brilliant. It's the deepest intellectual framework that you could ever go into, not to mention spiritual framework and all the other ways you could look at it. Jesus is not like I thought. This is not just a good story, just another good story. This is not, Jesus is not just a good man or even a great man. If what we just sang is true, and I believe it is, I know it is, then when Jesus died on that cross, it changed the possibilities of human life forever, no matter what field you're studying. You see, God has these, he built this universe with laws, laws that govern the planets and the galaxies and all of that laws that govern mechanics, laws that govern psychology, laws that govern health, all of these laws. And you know what it says in Jeremiah several times about God's laws? The only ones we actually ever rebel against are the ones about human beings. No one ever puts up a, a, a sort of um, protest against the law of gravity, for example. We know we have to live by it or something happens. In Jeremiah, the Lord says several times, please obey these laws so that it will go well for you. So that it will go well for you. There are laws of human flourishing about the way we use our bodies, about the way we use our minds. And those laws, you can break them because we have free will. Other material things and even other animals probably have no free will like we have. We can do that. So what did Jesus do for us that, like, caused the change in the world? Even Hegel said that. He said it caused a change in the entire world forever. Well, Jesus was the word, God, uh, John tells us, and we learn in Genesis that God speaks and all this world's created, and we learn in Hebrews that it's Jesus that actually created everything. Then Jesus comes to earth as a human being, and here's the amazing thing about Jesus. It tells us several times in Hebrews about this. He went through every single temptation that you and I can ever go through. Every single one. He went through every temptation without sinning. So when he was crucified and buried, he could not even stay dead. He was perfect. He's perfect. He's perfect. The perfect example. 
And that's why he can forgive our sins. I don't know about you, but when I sit down at night and pick up my Bible, God's always showing me a passage that suggests that there was something I did that day, at least one, maybe many, that was really a sin. And there's a solution for that. 1 John 1, 9 is the bar of soap scripture that explains it well. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just not only to forgive me. This is what's really important. Not only to forgive me, but to cleanse me from whatever it is in me that keeps me doing this. Right? That's pretty amazing. Well, I want to tell you something else about Mother Teresa. Right before I left... I was sitting like you're sitting, and she came out of the office, and when I was sitting and she was standing, we were the same height, okay? She was very tiny. And she started shaking her finger at me. Everybody says to me, wasn't she sweet? <laughs> and I think of all the times she shook her finger at me. And she said this time, they were all very important times. They were all very important messages. This time she said to me, God does not call everybody to work with the poor like he called us to. And God does not call everybody to live poor like he calls us to live. And then she shook her finger even more and got it closer to my face. And she said, but God does call everybody to a Calcutta. You have to find yours. Well, that hit me pretty hard because I was already a tenured professor, so I began to think, well, what, what does that mean? And then when I came back, I had an intellectual crisis. If you can imagine having a professor with an intellectual crisis, that's pretty bad. <laughs> I would actually begin to cry before I would go into class. And I didn't have an emotion about it. And I didn't know what it was. But here's what it is. We are mostly in the United States and Europe and maybe everywhere, hopping along on one foot with secular knowledge. And that's, you know, a lot of our textbooks, even at a Christian college, you can't really get outside the secular world. And there's this brilliance that's found nowhere but in Christ. Nowhere. But let me tell you, you're, you're, you're finding Calcutta. So I, after my intellectual crisis, I worked for five, five years on a book that kind of explained what's the secular version of this and what's the Christian version of this. But I want to tell you that you have a Calcutta coming. You've all been made perfect for what your calling is. And you're just discovering it. Like, you're in the greatest place. Like, you can just play around with all kinds of things and say, oh... I think I like biology. No, I think I like music, right? Well, here's some clues. It's your interest, of course. It's your interest. But it's also, and it's your talents. Some of you have just incredible talents. I mean, just look at our, um, our worship band today. So you have these talents, but it's also about your grievings. It's also about the things that you see in the world that grieve you, that you think you could do something about. Or maybe it's about a dream, like, I'd like to build a building that no one's ever even thought of as an engineer. Those are God-given desires of your heart, and you need to get in touch with them. Yes, we have other desires. Eastern religions, you know what they do with the desire of their heart? They try to get rid of it. Because they know that the desire of their heart will cause them to suffer. Yes, it will. But that desire that's deep in you also gives you the thing that you form your whole life around. And suffering, if you use it like Jesus and Mother Teresa and people who really know, you will find that suffering is one of your best friends. And you know why? Because I've, I personally, and I think most people can say this, have never grown in my spiritual life without something that I felt was su some kind of suffering. Whether it's small or large, suffering is the thing that will propel you in your life to become a greater person, a better engineer, a better biologist, a better musician, a better teacher. 
When I come and look at you, I just see the amazing potential that the world is waiting for. I mean, there are places you're going to be called that none of us could even imagine right now and think called to do things. And I'd like to take the next minute just to, um, to pray a little prayer for you. Lord God, I thank you first for letting me see some of your most precious children. We're all your children, Lord. And Lord, I just ask that you would lead them through open doors and closed doors to exactly their destiny, Lord. That you would begin to reveal their, Cal their Calcutta or their next Calcutta to them, Lord. That you would give them the grace to be able to forgive like Mother Teresa immediately. That you would give them the knowledge and the experience that when they take their own sins to you, that you not only forgive them, but you begin at that very moment to cleanse them. And Lord, no matter how many times we repent for the same thing, each time you cleanse us a little more. Lord, I hope you make them unhappy when they get off the path to you. I hope it doesn't take them as long as it did me. I hope, Holy Spirit, that you would go to them with cl in their classes and when they read books and novels and see movies, and that your Holy Spirit would give them a sign, a twinge, when they're seeing something wrong. And that you would, and that you would also reveal the right side of that, Lord. Lord, I pray mostly that they will have the grace to follow you all the days of their lives and to know you in your fullness, not just in their emotions, but in their mind and their spirit and their soul. And I pray these things in our precious, brilliant Lord Jesus' name.